So I can honestly say when I saw Time Series, I thought the multiverse, because that's about as close as I get in my universe. Um, but I am here to introduce my colleague, Sahi Mudiala, who is going to take us through this. So Sati, over, away, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I hope that you've been enjoying Dot .local NYC. Michael and I are really excited to talk to you today about implementing time series in MongoDB and practical use cases across multiple industries. But before we kick it off today, just by a show of hands, how many of you use a health tracker of some sort? OK, so a good number of you. And another quick question, how many of you view your health data over time? OK, so quite a few of you there too. So that's an example of time series data right there. And I don't know about you, but I like being um, aware of whenever I'm having an anomaly in my sleep patterns. And similarly, I'm really new to investing in stocks. So I like being able to see a forecast or a prediction of what a certain stock may be. Today, I'll be giving you an overview of time series, what makes it special. And I'll also be giving you an intro to time series collections before I hand it off to Michael, who will be telling you more about time series collections in depth before telling you about some of the new time series features with the 7.0 release. So without further ado, let's get started. First, what is time series data? Time series data is a sequence of data points collected over time in which insights are typically gained by analyzing changes. And so this means that we usually want to retrieve or work with all of the data points for a specific time period or for a time period from one or more specific sources. And time series workloads generally have a few key properties. So to start it off here, data normally arrives in time order. It's mostly immutable, so the data is primarily inserted rather than being updated. The data is indexed on time, which is the primary dimension, and is often associated with other dimensions. So this may be a sensor ID, for example, a customer identifier, or a stock ticker. And lastly, the data is often coming in high in volume. And so now that we know what time series is and some key properties of time series, you might be wondering, well, where is time series? And time series is really everywhere. It's common in a number of industries, from DevOps to logistics, retail and e-commerce, healthcare, energy, and IoT. And examples of use cases within these industries include tracking network traffic, disk rights and usage, sales of a product, stock prices, heart activity, and energy consumption. And there are two types of time series. We have regular time series and irregular time series. With regular time series, data is collected at fixed points in time. For example, you might be getting the temperature from a sensor every five minutes, or you might be pinging a server for CPU information every 10 seconds. And so as you can see on the left side with the graph in this example, data is collected every five minutes. And then on the other hand, with irregular time series on the right side, you can see that data is collected at uneven points in time, or rather whenever an event occurs. So for example, this may entail logging application request responses from an application's APIs. Okay, so you might be thinking, this is all very cool, but why should I care about time series? The answer lies in what the present and future looks like. We're seeing a lot of growth in IoT, and we're gonna have more and more sensors in the smart world. So in our homes, we might see things like smart light bulbs and smart thermostats, for example, and we'll also see other sensors in our vehicles, systems, and more. But this isn't the only place where we're seeing a lot of growth. We're also seeing a lot of growth in the virtual world with more microservices, containers, serverless architectures. And all of these have data points. And the data is constantly pouring out time series data. And with this, those who leverage time series data and the benefits that come with time series databases, which I'll be getting into in just a little bit, will be at a major advantage over those who don't. 
time series will be becoming more and more prevalent with AI and predictive analytics. So it's about, it's not just about having the data, it's about using that data to make predictions and even act on them sometimes in an automated fashion. With insights, you save time and have better anticipation and outcomes, which ultimately has positive business impact for you and also frees up your teams to do some other more impactful work. Uh, okay. With that, let's get into what makes time series data special. So what are some unique qualities of time series data? What are some characteristics that you may see in a use case that really um, jump out to you and say, this is a time series use case? So let's get into some characteristics here. The data comes in at a high frequency. It's ordered, but with some caveats here. So there may be some cases when you have out of order writes, like let's say there are network issues, and this is okay as long as it's more of an exception rather than the norm, um, because there are some downsides with write efficiency when it comes to out of order writes. As I mentioned earlier, time series data is append heavy and mostly immutable, so really inserting data, not really updating it. And recent data is much more relevant than historical data, which will be reflected in queries. So really querying hot data more often, not really qu querying cold data as much. And lastly, different rollups are meaningful in different time horizons. And you can think of these rollups as time series aggregations for summarizing data. So for example, this may be weekly or, a or annually rolling up something like sales data or rainfall in a certain region. Let's get into some patterns of time series data that we see pretty frequently. So as I just mentioned, um, hot data is really queried a lot more often. Cold isn't as much, so because it's infrequently accessed, it's often archived. There's typically a heavy use of time-based filters, which is again reflected in the queries. Periodic rollups are common, so weekly, annually. Window functions are often used as well, so you might be calculating something like the moving average, running sum, or year-over-year -year change. Spatio-temporal search may be used. And the data is indexed on time, which as I mentioned earlier, is the primary dimension and is also often associated with other dimensions, like could be a sensor ID. And lastly, the data may be used for monitoring and forecasting or anomaly detection. The question now is, why does time series data need a specialized solution? Why can't I just leverage something like a traditional database or a traditional MongoDB collection? And the key here is that time series databases have key architectural design properties that really make them re different from traditional databases. Um, time series data tends to be very write heavy, so the way that ingestion happens is different. Furthermore, um, and the way that data is stored in is also is different for read performance as data from a time period from a specific source and most recent data are more relevant. So MongoDB time series collections are very different from traditional MongoDB collections, which I'll be diving into in just a second. MongoDB is a subset of the OLAP market where OLAP stands for Online Analytical Processing. It has distinct read-write patterns. And when we talk about OLAP use cases, I'm referring to some of the characteristics that I just ran through on the previous slide. So let's dig into using a traditional versus a time series collection for a time series use case. Starting off with the traditional collection. Um, traditional collections primarily serve OLTP or online transactional processing use cases. And here, we take a time series use case. The data is going to be stored sequentially on a block on disk, which gives us a high write speed, and that's great. However, we're going to need multiple relatively large indexes stored here for time series data um, for reading the data for each of the small data points. So you're going to need one index for each individual data point that allows us to find it, delete it, and if necessary, use replication. 
and then you're going to need another index which contains the series and the time. So this may be the sensor ID and time. Um, and this is for uh, allowing us to find the range of time for a particular series by its uniquely identifying keys, whatever they may be. And ultimately, this leads to the data on disk not being well organized or stored efficiently for time series data analysis. And with this, there is a read and process penalty with fetching small records that are spread over multiple database blocks and disk blocks. And ultimately, this leads to wasted compute resources, which we don't like, we don't want to see. And boom, that's where time series collections really come in and save the day for time series use cases. So let's get into how they're helpful here. They provide the scale and usability that's really required of a specialized solution to be able to efficiently work with time series data and the performance of a time series database for reads, which is key. Time series collections have a specialized columnar format that organizes right so that the data from the same source is grouped and sorted together with other data points from a similar time period. And this is really helpful because oftentimes you're going to be querying data from the same time period from the same source. And lastly, time series collections are optimized for the storage and access of large amounts of time series data. And with this, you can easily and optimize optimally analyze your data over time, which is the big end goal. Now let's get into why time series collections by digging a bit into some recent growth and performance. But first, I want to introduce MongoDB time series collections. Just by a show of hands, who here already uses time series? OK, so a few hands. Cool. Great to see. And hopefully, by the end of this presentation, I can convince you to try it out and hopefully use it. But to give you an overview, time series collections are a specialized collection type that we provide. Um, and they really provide the performance of a specialized time series database. With this solution, we make it faster, easier, and less expensive to build and run time series workloads. And we launched time series collections as part of the 5.0 release. And it's an optimized collection uh, for storing and analyzing time series data with the underlying columnar storage format that we have. And there are a number of benefits with time series collections. Starting with increased developer productivity, improved query efficiency since the data that you're typically accessing is grouped and stored together, reduced I.O. for read operations, reduced index sizes, increased wire tiger cache usage, and specialized columnar compression was, results in a massive reduction in storage size. And let's look at that one more closely. So we optimize for the long-term benefits of read and storage as in the nature of pivoting to a columnar format coupled with the scalability improvements that we have in the 7.0 release. And so with the 7.0 release, when we compare traditional collections with time series collections for a time series use case, there's a 54% difference in storage size that we see here. And in this case, we had over 4 million documents, over five days of reporting on 100 devices with 10 seconds as the reporting frequency. And looking at the right throughput here, you can see that it's still very efficient, even though there's a little bit of a difference. And we're able, it's able to also be optimized further with batch loading, scaling the cluster, and some other best practices. In addition, the difference that you see here can be attributed to bucket reopening. Um, and it can be disabled if you want to prioritize rights over the benefits from scalability improvements of reopening the buckets further. Um, in a little bit, Michael will be going into the scalability improvements in more detail, and he'll also let you know how you can disable them if you want to really prioritize those writes. However, we usually see that fast reads are important, especially for commonly seen analytical query shapes like group buys. And we usually also see that efficient cost and storage is important, which is scalability improvements that we have in the 7.0 release are really aimed to provide at a small uh, potential sacrifice in write throughput that we can see here in 7.0 on a 
low cardinality simulated workload, but will improve loading times and we do expect less significant drop offs um, on more realistic workloads. So the difference that you see here shouldn't really be a concern or something that you would really even notice. The queries that you see here on the left are representing aggregates from simple to very complex over an entire data set. Details of these queries can be found in the MongoDB TSBS GitHub repository, where TSBS stands for Time Series Benchmarking Suite. Um, it was built by TimescaleDB and is the industry standard benchmark. On that note, here we see the query performance of Time Series in 6.0 versus 7.0, and for each of these query types, Time Series 7.0 has better query performance. Note that a lower number here is better. If we ran the same test on traditional collections um, and did not do uh, manual bucketing, the ratio on the right would have been much larger, so time series collections are really what you want to use for your time series use cases. We'll be elaborating a lot more on the work that went into 7.0 that directly maps to these results. Also, I realize I misspoke. Um, what we have here is time series collections um, in 7.0 and manual bucketing on traditional collections in 7.0 um, rather than 6.0 versus 7.0. But on that note, I'm excited to hand it off to Michael, who will be telling you more about working with time series collections. Thank you, Sahi. For those of you that don't know, I'm Michael. I'm a lead product manager at Mongo. I'm going to go through some more of the technical details and terminology related to time series and dive a little bit more into what's under the hood here and why these are so efficient for analytics or time series use cases. So you may be familiar with the traditional create command or create collection helpers in MongoDB. Well, when we introduced time series collections in 5.0, a big goal of ours was the user experience and making this very similar to a traditional experience or a traditional collection and make this as fast and easy as possible for developers to create these collections and, and start working with their data and gaining insights from it. So when you create a time series collection, it has all the same consistency guarantees as regular collections. And to create it, you use the same commands or the same shell helpers. In this instance, it's just the create collection. And you specify this time series option. Now there's a couple of required and optional parameters here, which we'll spend the next few slides going through. However, the only required parameter is a time field. Uh, if you're working with a time series collection and time series data, you must have a timestamp in your data. So when you create this collection, this is really the schema design aspect of it. And so it is an explicit collection, which is different from MongoDB collections, which are implicit by nature. It doesn't mean that you don't have the flexibility of the full document model, or you can't change and modify your data over time. However, it is very important to think about your schema design compared to regular collections up front because it will impact your performance and ultimately your experience. So when you create the time series collection, you specify a time field. This is really that top level or root level field of your timestamp in your documents. The next optional parameter is the meta field or piece of metadata, right, or group of metadata. So this is really a label or tag that uniquely identifies your time series. To think about how you're going to choose your, your meta field and your metadata, right, it's something that never or rarely ever changes. It's your secondary dimensions that you're going to query on, right? You're going to filter on this data. Think about equality matches if you know your query up front, what you're going to slice that data on aside from time, right? As Sahi mentioned, time is the primary dimension here. So a lot of the optimizations are already in place for the time dimension. But when it comes to other optimizations, the meta field is really where you could start to take advantage of efficient queries and more efficient storage. We'll talk a bit more about the meta field on the next slide and how it serves as an efficient partition, really, for the way the data is stored on disk. The next piece of terminology is, is a metric. So this is not something you need to specify or you need to set. This is really just um, for educational purposes. It's any other field in your document or set of fields. It's often a set of related key value pairs. Um, it could be an object. It could be an array, nested objects. It's as flexible as any other document in MongoDB. However, since we're going to optimize the format of time series collections under the hood for you, 
it works very well with just having a flat model, right? The most intuitive way to store your data or documents could very simply be a flat relational type of model. Or if you prefer objects or we're used to working with more complex structures, all of that is still supported and just as flexible. A measurement is really just the definition of a user-facing document inserted into a time series collection, right? It encompasses everything that we just talked about. In this example, the meta field is the sensor ID, the timestamp is our time field, and the temperature is our metric, right? We're only collecting one single metric here, but it's very likely of many metrics or multiple pieces of metadata associated to this. So now to dive a little bit into how these parameters impact the storage and the overall storage format of, of the MongoDB time series collection. So the next concept here in terminology is a bucket. A bucket is just like any other bucket in reality, right? And conceptually, it's a group or a store of documents. So let's run through an example here. In this uh, fictionary collection of a time series collection we have called weather, we insert two documents with the same structure. Our metadata is a sensor ID. It's a single key value pair. Our time field is a timestamp. And the metric we're collecting is temperature. Say we're collecting this every few minutes from different weather sensors across the globe. Well, when you insert the, that data as single documents, what's actually happening under the hood conceptually is that we're going to take that meta field, that sensor ID in this example, and use that as a top level partition for this concept of a bucket. And then underneath that partition, we're going to have columns of data. This is the columnar storage format that Sahi mentioned previously, right? So we see columns for a timestamp, and we see a column for a temperature. Right, so that's the meta field and the metrics underneath it. So let's dive a little bit deeper into a bucket. So on the left-hand side here, that same example, right? Uh, we're looking at two sensors here, sensor 789 and sensor 456 as our meta field. And we get this insert many statement that comes in. So just keying in on sensor ID 456 on the left-hand side here, the first aspect is creating that top-level partition of the bucket, right? So we're going to deduplicate the sensor ID to be a top-level meta field of 456. And the goal of a bucket is to fill it, right? Store it with many things. So what's going to happen is as inserts come in, like the second insert here for uh, 456 on the bottom of the screen, we're going to continue to update this single document. So on disk, you're actually only going to have one document for multiple inserts. In this simplified example, two documents are stored as one on disk. And this is where a lot of advantages are going to come in, especially with indexes, storage performance, and read performance. However, like any disk block or document, and any bucket in conceptual reality, it's finite in size. And since we're working with time series data, we want to take the bucket and have it be finite in terms of its size for a time range, right? So at the top level here, we have this control field. You could think of this as the metadata for a bucket um, on our end, right? And it's really like an OLAP cube, small amounts of summaries. Today, we just store the min and the max. So with the min and the max timestamp being stored and calculated, when we fill up a bucket, it's for a specific time range. Our goal, ultimately, is to get 1,000 documents inserted into a time series collection into one bucket for each unique value of a metadata. And the way we control that timestamp that bounds the bucket in size is through the optional parameter granularity. By default, this is set to seconds, so that left-hand side, high-frequency time series data, right? And so what this means is that you, you don't need to be collecting your data in second intervals or over seconds. It's about the ingestion rate as it relates to each unique meta field value. So you might be collecting data from an F1 car around a racetrack, right? You're working in microseconds, nanoseconds now. That's completely fine. You're not bound to the seconds aspect here. This really just means that a bucket can be as small as one minute or as long as one hour, right? It controls the minimum and maximum time span of that bucket, as our goal is to just keep storing documents for a time period. So as you can imagine now, really, what a bucket is and what, and what it's trying to do is to co-locate data into one document 
on a single page, right? So buckets can be stored and optimized to access less pages on disk, right? So now you're working with less data overall, you're working with less accesses, less IOs. This is gonna be more performant. However, not all time series use cases come in one size fits all. You could have lower frequency, and this is why we have minutes and hours as other options here. All of these, though, are ranges. They're not fixed. So Sahi mentioned that regular time series use case where I'm pinging the CPU every five minutes. Uh, weather sensors are reporting a batch load every 25 minutes, right? You know the intervals you're getting data. You know how much data should fit in a bucket comfortably. Or maybe you know about the query ranges. You're providing those periodic roll-ups that are very fixed in nature. You're looking at data in intervals of an even hour, maybe one hour, one week. So with that, we've launched with 7.0 a new granularity option for regular time series, for fixed time series use cases where your query patterns are very fixed in nature, maybe report dashboarding. I allow my users to slice by intervals of one hour, less ad hoc querying, less irregular aspects around it. So this allows you to basically just specify what you want your range of your bucket to be. How big do you want that bucket to be in terms of time? Maybe if you have really, really low frequency data, you want it to be as long as three months, four months. And that's completely fine. And now you can set that and control that. And this is really diving into the user experience goals of time series in general, right? We want you to have a lot of control over your data. While a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today and I have just talked about are implementation details, you still need control over this data and it's helpful to know these things, especially ahead of time, when you're doing your schema design or your data modeling. The last parameter we'll talk about is expire after seconds. This is something you may be familiar with, but in time series collections, this replaces time to live indexes or TTL indexes. This is gonna allow us to efficiently delete data for specified time ranges, right? This is your data lifecycle policy. And you can set this at any point. You can change this, turn this on and off as your requirements change for deleting data. So I want to run through a quick scenario for data modeling. We're collecting streaming market data for data trade streams for indexes, say the NASDAQ or the S&P 500. Your ultimate goal here is to aggregate trade information such as price and quantity over time and uh, by events for say a stock symbol or uh, a ticker symbol, example MDB for MongoDB or MSFT for Microsoft. Your data looks like this from your API, right? You have an event type, tells you it's a trade or some other event. You have an event time, that's your timestamp, your time field. You have a symbol which identifies the security symbol, an ID associated with each unique trade, a price, a quantity, and then two other ID fields that identify the buyer and the seller, right? There always has to be a buyer and seller when it comes to a trade. So a good meta field for this example would be the symbol, right? That, that stock ticker symbol, MDB. This is gonna be a good secondary invention for us to slice the data on, right? This is our primary goal, and it's gonna be a good group key for partitioning that data, right? That top level partition is what we need to be able to group on. So, on the right-hand side, we have a bad metadata field, which we have a symbol and the trade ID as an object under meta. Can anyone tell me why this is a bad meta field? Sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so trade ID is unique with each trade. We're never gonna be able to match on that trade ID, right? That one, two, three long number is always gonna be a new number associated, so we'll never be able to group documents together. And what this ultimately introduces is unbounded cardinality, right? So cardinality is the number of unique things, aka time series, and it's the total number of unique combinations value, or values for your meta field. This is our partition, this is our group key. We have to match on this, right? So in this simple example, we're just using a single key value pair of sensor ID. My cardinality is now equal to however many sensors I'm collecting data from. Maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 1 million, could be 100, right? But it's very easy to calculate and understand your cardinality, your horizontal scale or your partitions of the buckets we need to create and manage. Like the document model and secondary dimensions in general for use cases, 
The metadata field can be multiple key value pairs or of different data types. In this example, it's an object with two different key value pairs, a sensor ID and a locale. Now my cardinality is going to grow, though, with each field that I add, because my cardinality is now equal to the cross product of all of the unique values. Each insert you, you uh, submit to the time series collection with a different value for these, these different properties creates a new partition, a new bucket, right? A new page that we need to co-locate data to. So let's dive a little bit deeper into time series collections. So when you create a time series collection, which we just showed, what really happens is a user-facing, specialized, writable view is created. This is to provide you with the user experience that's going to be the easiest way to work with time series data, especially as it grows, or not have to worry about as much of what your data looks like, right? And in between, we have what's called a bucket catalog. And this is what we'll talk about for most of the rest of the presentation. The easiest way to think about this at the high level is this is responsible for shredding your documents into the columnar format, right? It's transforming the user-facing inserts that you're writing as single documents, which we'll sh we sh showed in a few slides and we'll see again, into that optimized persisted collection, which is that columnar bucket format. Now, this collection is not hidden from you as users. It's there, but again, it's an implementation detail. You should never have to work with anything except the user-facing view. So when you insert data into time series collection, looks and feels just like a regular collection. You can issue all your commands to it. You can write to it. When you query it, you get your data back just as you insert it. But of course, we don't store the data like this. That's what we're talking about here, right? This would be completely inefficient to store data like this. Your system would fail over. You would not be able to read your data. So that bucket catalog, right? So this is responsible for the bucketing and a bit more. The interesting thing to talk about here is that, by default, we allocate 2.5% of total physical RAM for this bucketing catalog. So what that means is that, by default, we have an active hot cache that's using the percentage of, of your physical RAM for the horizontal scale of your cardinality. So if you have 7 million devices inserting, you're going to need more RAM. And that's, and that's what version 5 and version 6 basically had the equivalent of scalability for, right? It, it was an, it's a an in, complete in-memory process that requires more, more memory. It's also going to be responsible for compressing your data to give you that better access to the Wire Tiger cache. And it's going to do all of those transformations from single documents that you're inserting, the user-facing documents, into the actual buckets in the collection. And keep track of all that metadata that we're storing, the min and the max, and the summary levels. So let's look at a quick example. In version 5.6, as I said, this was a simple LRU cache using 2.5% of your total physical RAM. In this example, we have three unique sensor IDs inserting, getting transformed into that, that bucket. So these buckets are being created now. However, in 7.0, one of our marquee releases here is enhanced scalability. And we'll show how this works on the next slide. But what this really is about is making it easier, less expensive to scale for high cardinality workloads, right? In reality, high cardinality is a thing that many of you probably have for your time series use cases, right? A single truck alone or a car off the dealer lot down here can have hundreds of sensors in your car collecting data from, right? That's just hundreds in a single vehicle. How many vehicles does Toyota produce a year, right? This is a lot of data that needs to be collected. It's expensive to scale RAM. We don't like you to have to vertically scale your RAM for your cardinality. It's not intuitive as well. And you shouldn't be having to touch knobs to use more of your physical RAM and worry about oom happening and, and all the other processes that are using uh, your actual RAM. So with that, we've introduced the concept of bucket reopening. So in versions five and six, when we had this hot cache with all of your active buckets that we're inserting and updating to, we would have to close them when the cache became full. This is because it's very expensive to go to disk, right? It would be a huge write amplification problem if we were to go to disk and constantly bring the buckets back into the hot cache to keep inserting them just to fill them. Now, we made the choice at the time, basically, to say, 
we require more RAM to support the higher cardinality workloads, so larger machines, more hardware, um, to avoid the right amplification and cost associated with reopening buckets. And this is going to provide the more flexible bucketing and the improved performance and the easier and ex less expensive scalability. So let's use that same example. Let's pretend our cache is full at three buckets. We know that's, that's not the case. We could fit a lot more um, on, on small machines. But for illustration purposes, let's just pretend. So we have an insert for 3, 2, 1, 4, 5, 6, 6, 8, 7, all unique. We create those buckets. Now there's only one document in these buckets. That's not good. We want to fill them with 1,000, right? Five minutes later, we get a few more inserts. Come in, and now notice the last document is for sensor ID 553. Well, OK, we already in the cache. We have 321 and 456. We'll transform those to updates. Now we have two documents in each of those buckets, and they can keep accepting. However, our cache is full, and sensor ID 687 is the least recently used bucket here. So in versions 5 and 6, we'd roll this off, we'd close this, and unfortunately, it would only have one measurement inside of it. And it would have less efficient storage and query performance in the long run. However, in version 7, with the enhanced scalability, we create the new bucket for sensor ID 553, and we take that least recently used bucket, or group of least recently used buckets, and we archive them. Very similar to an L1 and an L2 cache, except we're not using more memory for our L2 cache. What we're doing is we're storing less metadata about buckets in our archive. This means we can do query-based reopening for cheaper, and we still aren't having to pay the penalty of going to disk or use more RAM. So the results that we'll show in a minute here are really incredible for the amount of buckets we can now actively or concurrently manage in this hot cache at still only 2.5% of the total physical RAM. So using the same data set for that TSPS benchmark that Sahi mentioned, we increased the cardinality to 2.3 million devices with 64 gigabytes of RAM on our machine using the default 2.5%. The data was reporting at five, million, five minute intervals, and it was for four days. So this is about 3 billion total documents from a user-facing perspective that were inserted. The data size is reduced 76% from 490 gigs to 116. This is simply due to now we can get better compression at the columnar level. We're storing more data inside of our bucket, and we can more efficiently manage and control the user-facing document size. So this is where things become even cheaper. Time series already made things cheaper for you. Now it's even cheaper and easier. So there's also right amplification, as, as Sahi mentioned, right? We need to think about when we create these buckets, we have to create these summaries. It's not cheap to close and, re and create buckets, especially in a cash full scenario. So before scalability enhancements, the cache was obviously full. On 64 gigabytes, you know, you're looking at tens of thousands of buckets being able to easily and efficiently be managed. We're talking now 2.3 million. So it took 100 hours to load due to the right amplification with creating and closing buckets. Well, after scalability, without that amplification, it's 43 hours. And because we're storing more documents in a bucket now, and we have better compression, we're able to improve that read performance that we're looking for just by having better efficiency at the cache level or the insert path, right? So looking at some of the same queries here from before, we see improvements from as much as 31 times as much compared to when buckets were prematurely closed. So last thing I want to talk about here when it comes to the time series collection, some of the efficiencies, is how indexes work. So Zahi mentioned that time series databases need to understand time. They need to treat time as that first class dimension. Well, the way we, we do that, first and foremost, is we create a clustered index when the collection is created. A clustered index is simply controlling the order of data on disk. So, for time series use cases, we want to order the data on disk by time. Now we can more efficiently access our tree. Another property of a clustered index is that the leaf nodes are your data pages. So we're now reducing the amount of operations or hops within our tree. We can directly access data pages. And we've already talked a bit about how we've reduced the amount of data we're working with, because we're co-locating it now on smaller documents. On Our pages can store more, right? Our blocks are more efficient. So, 
However, this is not defined on a user aspect of time. This is not, we are not creating a clustered index and storing your data in the user facing way you would think for your measurement time in your documents. It's on that bucket time, right? First and foremost, we want to work as a query perspective with buckets. And we want to do indexes on buckets. This is going to allow us to do things in batch, right? We're going to be able to do group operations. We're going to be able to do summary level to reduce the amount of data we're working with or pulling from disk first and foremost. And when it comes to secondary indexes, you can put secondary indexes across a time series document on any field, right? Maybe you need to look for where temperature, in our example, is greater than 90 or greater than 75. You can create an index to do that, and it'll be very efficient to do that. However, unlike with traditional collections, we're not paying a penalty for creating an index on each individual document to gather some of that read performance efficiency. We're creating it at the bucket level. This means that we see a reduction in index size of over 100 times. Right? If we're storing 1,000 documents as one document on disk, and we're only indexing at the bucket level, we're now able to efficiently uh, reduce the size of our indexes. And when we access that data, we're indexing that data at the bucket, we're indexing that summary level information, that min and those, the min and the max values. Right? We're able to provide very efficient range scans, not just on time, but also on your metrics. Right? We're able to bound the queries two specific sets of buckets. Work with less buckets. So without further ado, I'm going to run through some of the other new time series features in 7.0. We already talked about one of the marquee things with enhanced scalability, right? That's going to give you a much better performance and much cheaper infrastructure to work with millions of devices or millions of customers as your metadata. Well, I'm going to contradict myself and Sahi a bit here. We know that time series data is mostly a pen, but we've heard from users like yourself and maybe some of you in the audience here. There are many use cases for wanting to update and delete your data, have more fine-grained control of your data. Maybe there's a network error and your devices have sent duplicate batches of data. Maybe uh, you're collecting data for customers and a customer needs to update values. Or maybe you're running machine learning data models and you have forecasted values in your document and those forecasts change over time as your model becomes smarter or retrains itself. So with, uh, with MongoDB 7.0 and time series collections, we've introduced the fine-grained control for support for arbitrary deletes and updates across any field in your document. So this is going to support all of the traditional update, delete commands that you're used to working with uh, through MongoDB and other systems, things like find and modify. So, it's still not recommended to come with an update-heavy workload. right? We still want the data to be append. You'll have the most performance and efficiency. However, this is going to allow you for that modification control so you can more easily work with your data for any of your use cases. right? Mm -hmm. Next, we, not, we, had, we have not just worked on the performance for the scalability aspects here. We've continued to improve query performance. right? It's about the storage and the read. So, while the storage side of scalability gave us better read, we've continued to improve query performance. We have a columnar format. We, time series data is analytical in nature. Right? We could take a lot more advantage of the summary level information. Or if you're using the new fixed size bucketing with the granularity controls, we could take more advantage of knowing exactly how big your bucket is. It isn't dynamic in size like the other controls can, can happen with. So, a lot of this is under the hood query performance aspects. But one notable thing to talk about here is streaming dollar group. If you're familiar with MongoDB group operations or dollar group, this is a traditional blocking stage and a blocking stage on uh, regular collections. But what streaming dollar group is going to allow us to actually stream the group when you're grouping your data on time, those periodic rollups, right? Now you're going to be able to create those faster. You're going to get your data in, uh, in a fraction of a time when it comes to getting that first batch. Right? Maybe you're grouping uh, for 24 hours, you're going to start to see that data come back faster. You're going to be able to iterate and page that data easy. We're going to be able to avoid the hash ta table operations that occur with group, and we're going to just overall perform better on those analytical queries, especially working with the time dimension. And last but not least, sticking with the theme of more enhanced user control for everyone here, and better support for working with your data, we've introduced partial TTL indexes. So we talked about the TTL indexes before. You could delete data based on a time range. 
Now you can actually create additional secondary indexes with TTL properties to expire data or control the life cycle of your data based on not just the time, but what your metafield values are. Let's take an example. You're collecting data at the metafield of a customer ID, and you have two tiers of customers, a free tier and a paid tier. Your free tier, you want to delete that data every seven days. They're not paying you any money. It's expensive to store all of their data. They, you want to incentivize them to upgrade to your paid tier. Now your paid tier then, you can keep data for 45 days. You can keep it forever, right? You can now find multiple TTL indexes to accomplish these fine-grained deletions at a more automated way, or use the new update and delete support. I'm out of time. I hope you enjoyed everything. If you have any questions, we will be around, Sahi and I, and feel free to grab us. <laughs> <laughs>